never get at the underlying problem. Right, what is the underlying problem? Now we've done it. Now we've, we've been through enough of that, right? We go through the process of elimination, we know what isn't the fix. There's not a technological fix that's gonna save us from the police and police brutality. There's not gonna be any policy tweak, any implicit bias training or de-escalation training. That ain't gonna do it, right? You know where I'm ultimately gonna go. We're gonna talk about defunding the police, but even before we get there, even before we get there, there's something deeper. There's a deeper problem that those issues, those fixes, those interventions never got to, and that is black lives just don't matter in America. Right, let's get down to the nitty gritty, what is real, right? From the inception of this country, founded in the, according to the Declaration of Independence, in liberty, in democracy, right? That was the promise. Those were the aspirations. The people who wrote that document, Thomas Jefferson wrote it, the people who endorsed it, like George Washington, they own people like me, right? I was on an auction block in an open market, right? That's what the Declaration of Independence, from the inception of this nation, black lives haven't mattered. Then you know what? After about, oh, roughly 100 years, a little less than 100 years, we had a cataclysmic race war with 600,000 dead Americans, right? That now, now we're getting to Juneteenth. Now, if you wanna talk about allyship while we're going through this part of the, the history line, let's talk about allyship for a minute. We had, out of that 600, 000, those 600,000 dead Americans, a good big chunk of them, around 300,000, were white folks fighting to end slavery filling their blood on the battlefield. That's allyship. Or you wanna talk about allyship? Talk about Gettysburg, all right? Talk about the people will, brother, brothers going after brothers. You know, family members, God damn it, this has gotta end. We can't keep these black bodies in bondage any longer. Right, that's what allyship looked back, like back then. Right, if you ain't talking about that kind of allyship, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, that, now we're talking. Then, all right, here comes Juneteenth. They finally, black bodies aren't in bondage technically. Notice they had to do that because the Supreme Court in 1857 said, black people have no rights that a white man must respect. That's why we had to go to that cataclysmic race war because the Supreme Court wasn't worth a plug nickel in terms of caring about black lives. All right, and then now, okay, now we, we finally, Juneteenth, we got the yoke of, of slavery off our back. Jim Crow, here comes Jim Crow. Racial apartheid, American style. 100 years of that, because black lives, again, did not matter. Enough for them, to, for us to be anything other than second class citizens. All right, now you finish 100 years of Jim Crow, what comes next? You know when we were walking over here, what comes next? You know what, what the march that we, we were doing just before we got over here? We walk through Skid Row. That's what's next. Skid Row is the fiercest expression of structural violence in America. The biggest homelessness encampment in America. Look at the families. Go through Skid Row and look at the families living in those conditions. Right? The little kids living in those conditions. Right? And look at and then look at the faces. And count them. I just had to do this for an article. 75% of those faces are black. Not people of color faces, they're black faces. Go into the jails and the prisons where I take my students up to San Quentin and Terminal Island down in San Pedro. Guess what? You'll see the same demographics you see in Skid Row. 75% of those faces in some of those places are black. Sometimes it's as low as 55, 65% which make up 8% of the state population, do the math. Grossly disproportionately black faith. The two most miserable places in our country, the, where the most maligned and marginalized people in our nation are, Skid Row and those jail cells are full of black bodies and faces. Cram, packed, brimming with black bodies, right? Who is COVID-19 disproportionately hurt hitting? Do the math again, black bodies. Right, why? Environmental racism. We're living near places that are giving us asthma, which is a comorbidity factor. 
We're living in race under racial oppression, which gives you high hypertension, a comorbidity factor. Sugar diabetes, food deserts, a comorbidity factor. Right? When are black lives going to start to matter? You want to see what the trope, the clearest trope that I have of that demonstrates that black lives don't matter? Some of you may be too young to remember this. Google it, the older heads remember this vividly. Black bodies standing on those rooftops with water literally coming up to their necks on the rooftops, right? One day goes by, no help. Two days go by, no help. Three days go by, no help. Four days, the cry of distress is supposed to be the summons to relief, no help. Sean Penn, of all people, I remember him rowing up there in a rowboat, four days in, handing out fresh water because FEMA still couldn't get its act together for those black bodies standing on those rooftops with water coming up to their neck. That's what Skid Row is, right? That's water coming up to people's neck and people not giving a damn about it. <laughs> Compare the response of America to those black bodies on, in the Ninth Ward to the response after 9-11 when those planes ran into those buildings in New York. There was a panic of empathy for those victims. We just got it done. Nobody wanted to hear a damn thing about any bread tape, any bureaucratic impediments. We just got it done because those lives matter. There was a panic of empathy for those lives. They weren't like those black lives that didn't matter that we could wait five, six days to get around to, maybe. Right, there's an empathy deficit in this country when it comes to black lives. There are, and if you're, if you're not dealing with that problem, you're not dealing with the underlying issue here. Let me deal with one more canard before I go on because you'll hear this a lot and it's sickening how much you hear. And I hear you heard, where, where's, the, where's the damn police, police building? Right down here, right down here. I stood in in a police commission meeting when Charlie Beck, chief of police, was sitting and sat down, he said, how can people in the black community expect others to respect them when they don't respect themselves? This is the chief of police, right? He was talking about, and you've heard this plenty and you're gonna hear it again. He was talking about black on black violence. And he was saying, you can't complain about black on black violence, rather you can't complain about blue on black violence because of all the black on black violence. You know, you know, blue on black violence is a drop in the bucket. Pales in comparison to black on black violence. Right? How many times have you heard it? Turn on Fox Radio, turn on Fox TV, that's all you'll hear. That'll be the drumbeat. Right? You'll hear half you'll hear that half the time on CNN. Alright, now let's deal with that canard right off the bat. Let's put it put that zombie argument. You know the thing, here's the thing about zombie argument. You shoot them, you shoot them, you kill them again and again, they keep coming back. They keep getting up. So this is a zombie argument that just keeps shambling along, but let's put it to rest again. Let's try to nail some nails in this coffin. Right? Here is why blue on black violence can't be compared to black on black. And this is what I told Charlie Beck when he said that. I got up to the microphone. They limited it to two minutes. They were getting ready to jump on me, but I, was, I, held, I had a good grip on the microphone. <laughs> They were going to have to pry my fingers loose. All right, and I said, Char Chief Beth, I remember after that sickening procession of hashtags year after year, 2013, 2014, 2015, fi finally Philando Castile was the last straw for some people when he, that, he, when Philando was shot in his seat, doing what, nothing what he wasn't supposed to do, and the little girl was in the back seat, it was Facebook Live, and she was crying, and her mother, remember that whole scene? That was the last straw, and somebody snapped. A couple people snapped. This is unfortunate. A couple people snapped, and officers were shot in Dallas and Baton Rouge. Horrible thing, right? And Charlie Beck and a lot of other police chiefs all over the country said, we're gonna fly the flags at half mast, and when you attack an officer, an attack on an officer is an attack on America. That's what he said. I said, all right, all right, Chief Beck. Okay, let's go with that logic. 
Okay, an attack on our officer is an attack on America. Well, by the same damn token, an unjustified attack by a police officer on a black person is an attack by America on that black person. All right? That's America shooting Walter Scott in the back. That's America dragging Sandra Bland out of her car and beating the hell out of her. That's America choking Walter Scott to death. That's America standing over Philando Castile with the gun pointed. That's America with its knee on George Floyd's neck as he's gasping out his last breath. You don't get to be America when you're a victim, then you're just an ordinary citizen when you're a victimizer. No, when you do wrong as America, you implicate all Americans. You, you make us all accomplices. You act under color of law, in our name, on our behalf. The blood that's on your hands is on our collective hands. That's not the way it is with a private citizen. You don't get to have it both ways. Right? We gotta shut that line of BS down every time they try to bring it up and keep focused on what we're really talking about, America's complicity in the oppression of black people. Now, defund the police, hell yeah. Let's get to that. When I walk through Skid Row, by the way, LA Can is like my heart. And when it comes to Skid Row organization, grassroots organization that's really got it going on, LA Can. But when I walk through Skid Row and see the, mal the malign neglect that's going on there, I can't help but think about our bloated police budget. All right, here's what we're talking about, people. Check these numbers, because I, you know, as a prop, I have to have receipts for every goddamn thing I say. <laughs> I got the receipt. Okay, Garcetti, his last budget that he was proposing before he started to reel it back a little bit, walked it back a little bit, hardly any, 3%, had, has a $5.5 billion slush fund, basically. That's the unrestricted funds in the city budget annually. Basically, $5.5 billion. Of that $5.5 billion, they, he had 53.7% of that going to the LAPD. 53.7%. Okay, now, he said, oh, uh, he came out and he got people patting him on his back. Oh, well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're only going to take, we're going to take $150 million of that and we're going to divert it. $150 million from billions of dollars? Do the math, right? Take those funds, make a deep cut in the police budget, take those funds, put them, divert them to social workers, the housing for the houseless, the jobs for the jobless, the food for the hungry. Do something about the crumbling schools with that money. That makes us all safer because people are drawn out of, pulled up out of criminogenic conditions that make them tempted to do crime in the first place. That's what safety looks like, spending on prevention. Not on more police. Google at some point, Safer Cities Initiative, 2006, they put 80 new cops on here on Skid Row to crack down on the down and out for their own good, supposedly. So-called therapeutic policing, because we're going we're gonna to police our way out of homelessness. Matter. Don't use that slogan. No slogan you come up with will they be happy with. None. Right? Black Lives Matter has always meant one thing. Not that white lives don't matter. Not that... Asian lives don't matter, not that Latino lives, but Latinx lives don't matter. It's always meant black lives matter also. Black lives matter too. It's been an ellipsis. We left out here. Right, so let me just wrap up with this real quickly because 
When I think about black bodies in bondage, I think about my own dad. He was given 22 to 55 years for possession and sale of marijuana back in the 60s when that's how they brought down black men. All right, he had the temerity, six foot eight inch barrel chested black man to own property, had a better command of the Queen's English than a lot of the Lilliputians around him in the white establishment. So they had to get rid of him, locked him up, he didn't want to rot in that jail cell because he was going to do all 55. He was one of those uppity Negroes. Right? He was one of them that they call, this is why I, my book is coming out on, uh, on August 18th, I call it nigger theory because that's what they call him, people like my dad. Right? They're that blood-soaked epithet. Right? But rather than roll over, he started pulling books down from the warden's own library. taught himself constitutional law, criminal law, criminal procedure, got a royal manual typewriter and started typing it on the bottom of that cell floor, wrote his own writs of habeas corpus, represented himself pro se up through the state system, up through the federal system. Until I was standing there, I lost him when I was eight years old. You want to talk about family separation? Family separation's been going on in America for a long time. It's called the prison industrial complex. So I'm standing with him now as a 14-year-old five years later in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, and he's arguing before an en banc panel of judges literally for his life. And I teach his case now in my criminal law class, Armour versus Salisbury that he prevailed in, and it stood for the, it stood for the basic proposition. Think about this, his case had established this law. It stands for the basic proposition, of the, the, it's a denial of due process for the prosecutor, the DA, Jackie Lacey must go, by the way, for the Woo! DA. It's a denial of due process for the DA to lie to the jury to get a conviction against the defendant. His case hadn't helped establish that. But, and here's what he said to me, and this is, this, is my, this is what I'm going to wrap up on. He said, you know, because I used to say, Dad, I can't understand, you know, how you, you know, even stay in the fight and do all that you do. I just would have said, I turned my back on all of this. He said, you know, that's what they want you to do. But what I was able to do was bend it into a beam of lyrical sound that turned the key in the jailhouse door that had me locked in. I made the frozen circumstances dance by playing to them their own melody. And that's what I see us getting ready to do. That's what we're going to do. Black Lives Matter.